Mic check. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to C3 Clang. Stress. La. <laughs> I brought my glasses. I remembered I woke up at 4 a.m. this morning because I had a bad dream that I forgot my glasses and I couldn't read any of my notes. <laughs> so at 4 a.m., I ran downstairs, took my glasses and put it in my handbag. Okay, so for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Sunita. Uh, and you all clap at the correct time. Uh. <laughs> Pastor uh, Joe and Pastor Stella are in Australia. Uh, they attended Presence Conference. My husband, Pastor Noel, is in uh, Club Med Chirating in his uh, company trip. So, you know, no choice. Lah. <laughs> But now I'm smarter. Every time I, he passes going away, I will put Noel under house arrest. He is not allowed to go at the same time. Hopefully this happens once a year only. <laughs> um, Pastor told me about four weeks ago that uh, you know, I'll be preaching on this date and I have been trying to pray and fast. Maybe I lost weight, maybe not. But uh, I've never had this much of stress, not even in my office, and I have a stressful job. But uh, this sort of stress is just unimaginable. <laughs> so I hope you all are prepared to receive the word. Uh, don't worry, I'll keep it short. I, Noel called me last night and said, how long is it going to be? Because when he first printed, he, he typed it out for me. It was 12 pages. I shortened it. So I told him I'll be shorter than you. Don't worry. I got targeted at 12 o'clock because I need to eat. I haven't eaten since uh, last night. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so are you ready? Let's pray. Yeah. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you for today, O oh Father God. We thank you, Lord, for your word, O oh Father God, that's going to be spoken, Lord, not from me, but from you, O oh Father God. We pray, Lord, that hearts will be opened, O oh Father God, to receive your word, Lord. We pray, O oh Father God, for fresh fire, fresh anointing, O oh Father God, to move among your people, O oh Father God, let they receive your word, O oh Father God. Lord, so today, O oh Father God, I also pray, Lord, that I don't misquote the Bible, O oh Father God, or misquote any verses, Lord, and finish on time. Lord, we just thank you for today, O oh Father God, and the joy and the peace. Let it flow among your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So today, uh, as some of you all have seen the advertising my husband and my sister has done over Facebook, today I'm going to talk about grace, right? So we came from uh, celebrating Easter and Good Friday, and the word grace just spoke to me. Uh, isn't that what Jesus dying on the cross was? It was about grace, about extending grace. And often we misunderstand the word grace. We often misuse it, right? Uh, you know, we always say His grace is new every morning. That doesn't mean that, you know, every day we can, morning grace is new, whole day we sin, and then next morning we say, okay, His grace is new every morning. No, right? So when we talk about grace, we're talking about God dying on the cross for us, he fulfilled um, the law. Uh, it was through his blood that we were redeemed, we were reconciled with God, right? So it's through, the, through Jesus dying on the cross. So that is what grace is. The Bible describes grace in Ephesians 2, 8. It says, for by grace you have been saved through grace and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So it means grace. Grace is given. It's not earned. Uh, we cannot uh, earn grace. It is Jesus giving us grace. It is a gift, right? And in Psalms uh, 103 verse 10, it says, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. So it means, you know, God, if, if God gave us what we deserved, we would be all dead. Right, Because the Bible says in Romans 6, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our God. Right? So if we really understood you know, what grace is, we would understand what Jesus did on the cross for us. He reconciled us with the Father. Right? So God gave us His grace through our faith in Jesus. Right? So we can't say... Just because we are under grace, we can do whatever it is we want. That's a misuse or an abuse of God's grace, right? So let me give you an example. Uh, 
with the glasses on, you all are blur. So an example of a workplace scenarios. I'm sure every one of you have been given a second chance, right? Have you had a second chance given to you? I, I just want to give you an example of, you know, grace in the workplace, for example. About 12 to maybe 15 years ago, I was a supervisor in an organization. Uh, I was a contact center supervisor. I had just recently won an award. Uh, I won an award as, you know, in, in, a, in a local uh, competition. I also won an, um, a scholarship uh, to pursue an, a management course, right? You know, I appeared in, in, in a magazine, my picture, you know, it was about 12 to 15 years ago. And, you know, I was really full of myself at that time because I thought, you know, I'm an award-winning supervisor, right? And then, you know, a headhunter came and, you know, offered me a, a position in another job uh, with a great salary, and I took it. Um, you know, so I went to this new organization. I was pioneering a new team. Um, and, you know, I was the first person that they hired in this new organization. And I thought, you know what, they are so blessed to have me because, you know, I'm an award-winning supervisor, right? So I started recruiting my team. I had a huge contact center, about 40 people, uh, processing team, and I started recruiting them because I was the supervisor. And then uh, as, you know, uh, we started going live with the process, you know, the client from U.S. came down, visited us, you know, I, was, I, I met the client, they were so happy with the process, happy with, uh, you know, what was going on in Malaysia because we were supporting a client in the U.S., and then a couple months down the road, uh, a new director was, uh, they brought in a new director, my new boss. Uh, and this young guy joins the organization as my boss. And I thought, hey, yo, who's this young punk? La? Right? I am the award-winning supervisor. I met the client. And now they bring this new person who's my boss. And he's barely two, three months on the job. Uh, and then he tells me one day, I need you to go and um, take over this new team. Uh, you need to take over this back-end processing team. And I thought, but that's six people, six people in this team. I said, I'm the award-winning supervisor. I have this 30 over people that <laughs> I'm supposed to manage, and you want me to go and focus on these six people. So I thought, okay, well, he's the boss, doesn't know anything, still new. <laughs> so I thought, you know, how bad could it be? I'll go and, you know, take care of these six people. Uh, and he kept telling me, make sure you understand the process. Uh, it's a very important team, and I thought it's back-end processing. What? How difficult could it be, right? I mean, I'm an award-winning supervisor. <laughs> so I went, uh, and I started uh, managing this team. I didn't really pay attention uh, to them because it was six people. They were just doing something which I thought was data entry. So, you know, not really important. And a couple months after that, uh, the client said they were going to fly in from the U.S. They wanted to come. They wanted to see the center that we had set up uh, and just understand what were the processes. Coincidentally, that week, uh, there was this huge changes that we had to process for about 40,000 employees in the U.S. So my data entry team, six people, I thought, how hard could it be? Let them just do it. Um, so, and I, being the supervisor, I have to check all these transactions that we were going to be processing because we were processing payroll for the U.S. And I didn't bother checking. I thought, how hard could it be? Just process, lah, right? Back-end work. So that week, we processed 40,000 transactions, payroll transactions, and that week I got ready for the client to visit because they were coming to visit me. They know me, right? I was the award-winning supervisor that they had, they had started this project with. So... They were due to come in that Monday. We were all ready. I had processed transactions the previous week. I had signed on, forwarded on to my payroll team in Jamaica, and I was ready. I thought, they're going to come, and they're going to tell me, you know what, you guys did such a great job. I gave you all 40,000 transactions, and you all processed it so well. That Monday, as the clients touched down, my new boss was with them, uh, and he came, they, it came on a, to, to the floor, the operations floor, to visit. And they get this urgent call, and they say, there was a huge mistake made in the U.S. 40,000 transactions were processed incorrectly and 40,000 people got paid incorrectly. And I was thinking, who did that? <laughs> right? I was thinking, how could, which idiot could have made such a mistake? Isn't it? 40,000 transactions. So 40,000 people got paid incorrectly in the U.S. I mean, in the U.S., you cannot pay people incorrectly. You can have lawsuits. You can have all sorts of things happening. 
So my new boss comes up to me and he says, I think someone's going to get fired. It seems that 40,000 transactions and 40,000 people got paid incorrectly. And he said, did, did you guys process anything? I said, we did. I'm not sure what it is because I didn't bother looking at it, uh, even though it was for my team to process it. So I went to my team and I said, did we process something? 40,000 transactions? And they looked at me and said, yeah, la boss, you signed it off, what? Didn't you do it? And I thought, oh my god, that was me. So I quickly went back and I looked at the work that I had done, the six people and I, and some of it I personally processed because I thought it was so easy, the spreadsheets upload, la, not realizing the mistakes that we did. So I had caused that 40,000 people in the US to be paid incorrectly. Right? And I thought, oh my God, I think I nearly cried <laughs> in the office that day, thinking, okay. And then the client comes onto the operations floor, these Americans. Uh, and they are like, so who made the mistake? Who made the mistake? We really need to know. And then my, my boss, the one that you know, I really didn't like, who was you know, barely a couple of months on the job, who was younger than me. <laughs> and he comes on the floor and he says, we will find out. Uh, and then he looks at me and he says, uh, come to my office. So I go, I'm shaking, my hands are sweating, and I'm thinking, I have to tell him it's me. It's my team. So I go up to his office and I tell him, uh, it's me, it's my team, but me primarily because I'm the supervisor who signed off the 40,000 payroll changes uh, without checking. Uh, so he just looks at me for a while and then he says, okay, go and make it right, go and correct it. So I said, but the client needs to know who made the error, right? It's me. They want to know because we are supposed to take action on the person who made the error. So he says, doesn't matter. I'll figure that one out, you go and correct it. So I go, I rush, I, me and my team, we start making changes, 40,000 corrections we had to make, right? And then we finished making changes, the client is on the floor, they are so angry, they have urgent meetings because these are 40,000 people who got paid incorrect salaries, right? So they have emergency meetings, they are talking to people in the US, they're trying to figure out how to make this right. And then I can hear in the background, they're saying, you know, this person needs to be given a warning, uh, you know, put on warning, put, when you have all this, you know, they, you, you likely get fired, right? Um, so I could hear it in the background and I'm thinking, finish, I'm going to lose my job. You know, I barely was in, <laughs> in the job eight months, I'm going to lose my job. Uh, and they want to know who made the error. So I remember at that time, we were sitting in a meeting room and they are focused on who made the error. And my boss walks in and they look, he looks at these Americans and he says, I made the error. So he doesn't look at me, he, he just tells them that he made the error. He says, I made the error, this is my team, I'm responsible. He says, nobody else, I'm responsible. So if you need anything to be done, I will do it. Now he's the director of the company, but he took the blame. It was his team, but he could have easily said, I made the error. Yeah, this is a supervisor you hired, the award-winning supervisor <laughs> that your headhunter hired. But he didn't. He just came into the room and he said, I made the error. So he said, not my team. There's nobody to blame in the team. We will correct it. I'm taking responsibility. And that was it. He said, I don't want to talk about it anymore. We will correct it, but it's my responsibility. So at that point of time, I thought, oh my God. You know, this man who I didn't like, <laughs> who I didn't treat really nicely, took my blame. And it kind of like opened my eyes because I thought, okay. It changed me because after that, I never made that mistake again. <laughs> right? You'd never ever make that kind of a mistake again. And it kind of just changed my whole uh, attitude towards my job with these six people that I thought was the smallest thing, and I realized how important that team was, uh, managing payroll for the US at that time. I, I thought it was just a data entry team, but apparently not. And that, that incident, sort of like, just my, my whole career after that, right, just took off. Because eight months down the road, I got promoted to manage the whole team. But if that one incident had been on my record, I wouldn't have got that promotion. Right? But it was because of my boss who decided at that point of time to show some grace. 
Isn't that like what Jesus did? You know, on the cross, he went, he took our sins, he took our transgressions, our iniquities, our, you know, everything, and he went to the cross, right, for our sake, so that we could be reconciled with the Father, right? So that is what grace is. It's, it's given. I, mean, I didn't deserve it. He didn't know me at that time, you know. He was barely three months. He didn't have to do it. He could have easily said, you know what, this mistake was made by the supervisor. You know, she should be put on a warning, she, you know, all that. But he didn't. What he chose to do was he took the blame and he realized that I was never, ever going to make that mistake again. Right? And that's what Jesus did. He took our sins. He went to the cross. But, and, and, you know, we, we are just given grace. It's not something that we earned. So that's what you know, I look at what grace is, grace is, and that's God's amazing grace. So coming, coming from grace, I think there's a couple of things that happens when, uh, you know, you, you experience grace, grace from God. What I experienced receiving grace uh, from my boss was being grateful, right? You should have an attitude of gratitude. I was so grateful that this man that I barely knew you know, took the blame for something that I was responsible for. And that's what Jesus did, right? He went to the cross and he took our sins, right? He was blameless, he was pure, and he took our sins. So when we have that attitude of gratitude, right? He didn't have to wake us up this morning, but, you know, by God's grace, we are here today. We, we have a family, we have friends. So just having that attitude of gratitude, being thankful, uh, thankful for every breath, that you have, thankful for your family, thankful for your friends, right? Every blessing for homes that we can go back to, right? Some of you own property. So just being, you know, just having that attitude of gratitude, that knowing that, you know, every minute that God gives you is by grace, by His grace. The song that we sang just now, um, Amazing Grace, I know most of you all are familiar with the older version, we, you know, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. We always sing it in a funeral. <laughs> Every funeral you go to, somehow or other, we sing amazing grace, right? Uh, so I was listening to that song when I was thinking of, of my message. And I wanted to know, why did this person write this song? Was, did he write it for funerals? Or, <laughs> right? It was actually written by uh, this person called James Newton. Somewhere in 1770 something, right? So James Newton was a slave trader. That's what Google told me. So James Newton was a slave trader. He was, you know what slave traders are? That from England, uh, they took slaves from Africa, they sold them off as, uh, you know, as workmen, as slaves, right? So he was captain of a slave ship. And, uh, you know, he, at that time, it was, it's really the worst thing to do. Uh, you know, selling, selling slaves. And, um, you know, there was, uh, he, he, he actually had few times where he, he nearly met his death uh, on the slave ship. Um, and so James Newton, I think at one time he encountered God. He en encountered having a second chance with God. And that's when he wrote this song. Because, you know, the song goes, right? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was once lost but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. So he's saying as when he encountered God, when he encountered God's grace, you know, uh, he could see now. You know, his eyes were open. He was lost, but he's found in God, right? And he wrote those songs. He understood, you know, those words. Uh, and then as a result, he lived his life very differently. So he stopped being a slave trader. Um, and he then worked towards, uh, you know, abolishing slavery in England. He worked with uh, a politician to abolish slavery uh, in England. So, it's, uh, if you look at Colossians 2, verse 13, it says, And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgot, forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirement that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So, when you are given that grace, when God offers us um, that grace, you know, it says you're forgiven by my grace. 
the law says when you sin, you die because the wages of sin is death. But God says, my son paid the price for your sins upon the cross so that my grace is available to you. Right? So when you, you know, suddenly encounter that grace, your whole life changes. Right? So if we understood the magnitude of grace, then we would we would understand why our lives need to change and your hearts would change automatically, right? The next point is having that uh, attitude of excellence. The Bible says we put off our old ways of life and we start putting on God's ways. So in Ephesians 4.22, it says, you were taught with regard to your formal way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. So... When you encounter God, when you understand the magnitude of grace, you, you realize that, you know, you, you can't live the same anymore, right? It's, it's different now. Right now, I am, I'm living with Christ. Jesus is in my heart. I have put away my old self. I, now I have my new self, right? So we look at serving with excellence. It's different now. I'm not going back to my old ways. So we don't downgrade our lives after we understand God's grace. We upgrade Right? In Luke uh, 2.52, we look at Jesus' example. It says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Jesus lived a life of excellence in four, four areas. Right? Mentally, because he increased in wisdom. Physically, stature. Spiritually, favor with God. And socially, favor with men. So now we look at ourselves. How are we serving God in these four areas? You know, whether mentally are we open to learning, uh, taking on new challenges, um, and just growing, growing in God's Word, right? Physically, our bodies are our temples, right? Um, so are we taking care of our bodies? Spiritually, are we growing? Are we reading God's Word and worshiping God daily? And socially, building relationships, right, in our church, um, Pastor Stella, in the last lead meeting, taught us how to share the word in one minute, right? Just sharing one minute of your testimony and, you know, just sharing that gospel. So are we doing that? Are we growing uh, socially in our relationships? We have connect groups, uh, you know, we come together just to share God's word. So it's just serving in excellence, having that attitude of excellence once you understand God's grace. Um, the third point uh, or attitude is having an attitude of reconciliation, forgiveness. God forgive us first, right? So in other words, you've got to make things right because now if God has forgiven you of your sins, of your transgressions, wouldn't you have that attitude of reconciliation, of forg forgiving others? Uh, you know, Christians should be the Fastest to forgive, isn't it? But sometimes that's not the case. We should be a church that's full of grace, that when we open the doors, people feel accepted. People who come into church feel accepted. Um, you know, they don't feel judged. They don't feel guilty because everybody sins, right? Every, every, one, of your, every one of you here, we live in sin. But, you know, sometimes we are the first to judge, right? Whoever walks through that door. So this should be a church that's filled with grace because grace was given to us. So as Christians, you know, we should be the first people who are graceful, right? Just accepting those who have come in for whatever background, you know, whatever that they have done, it doesn't matter, right? Because Christ has already uh, forgiven them. He died on the cross for everyone, not just an uh, uh, exclusive group, right? So having that attitude of reconciliation, uh, you know, when through Jesus' blood, harmony was restored. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the kind of attitude that we should have uh, in reconciliation. I like um, the story of the tax collector, Zacchaeus. After receiving God's grace, um, when Jesus visited his home, immediately he said to him in uh, Luke, Luke chapter 19, verse 8, he says, Lord, Lord, I give half of my wealth to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore a fourfold, right? So he's saying that, you know, I've received this grace, this grace that came from God, and immediately he changed. He had that sense of urgency to change immediately because of that attitude of reconciliation, 
And that's what happens when we understand God's grace and we receive God's grace. Um, and it all is also for the church, right? In Matthew 5, 23, verse 24, it says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come after and off offer your gift. So Jesus is telling us relationships are important, right? It's, it's more important than doing church uh, because when we understand grace, we will have that sense of urgency to make things right with people that, you know, that we have wronged or they have wronged us. Relationships are important, especially in the church. Um, so God wants us to understand, right, that don't come to an offer, an offering, if you have grudges, if you have broken relationships, go and amend those relationships, right? It doesn't matter who's right, who's wrong, but in your heart, amend those relationships so that when you are reconciled, you understand the grace that was extended to you, that you would extend that grace. Okay. My husband wanted me to end with new roads, new rivers. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. <laughs> so, again, so when we talk about grace um, and we understand the magnitude of grace, I think what's important is the change in our hearts, right? Sylvia, all, Sylvia asked you all to see where your heart is, right? It's the change in your heart. When you understand and you receive the grace of God, then you understand why it is you need to change. And change should happen from the inside, right? Change happens when you understand the magnitude of grace. You're grateful for that magnitude of grace that Jesus dying on the cross has given us today freedom. And then you understand the excellent, the excellent God that we serve, which is Jesus, right? So that we should be serving in excellence. And we understand that because God has given us that grace, that we too should be showing others that grace. I mean, how, how else is peop are people going to feel grace if it's not through us, right? I mean, you can't expect God to come down and show grace again, right? It's through His people, through Christians, right? That people feel love, people feel grace, people feel the acceptance of God, and that's how we understand grace, right? So we should be the first people that are extending God's grace, right? So the Bible says in Isaiah 43, verse 18 to 19, it says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it, now it shall spring forth, shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the des desert. That's our theme for 2019, right? So that we take hold the newness of life that is available to us in Christ Jesus. We let go of the old, uh, all the old things, all the former things, and we focus on God. Because when we understand grace, now we can in turn uh, have that new life in grace. And God continuously, right? We say His grace is new every morning. It is new every morning, right? So there's no condemnation. Everyone's fall shots uh, and sins. But His grace is renewed every morning. He gives us second chances, third chances. God is a God of multiple chances, right? But it's up to us to take Him on His word and to stop uh, sin in our life continuously. We can never be perfect, but continuously stop and, you know, just take up that and understand what He has done for us on the cross, right? And then put away your old self and have the renewed new self in Christ. So, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, Behold, all things have become new. So today I pray that you find peace with God. You understand His amazing grace. You understand He's a God of restoration. You understand that uh, in God, we are re reconciled with the Father. And it's through Him that, you know, through Jesus, through 
uh, his love that we are reconciled and that we are co-heir with Jesus, right? That we have victory in Jesus. But first, we just need to understand the grace that has been extended to us, his amazing grace. Amen? Amen. So today, just in your hearts, just pray that, you know, God gives you that understanding of his grace that we didn't take lightly um, last week as we celebrated Good Friday and Easter. Um, you know, it's, 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 it sometimes becomes so ritual that we forget the, the real meaning of, of Good Friday uh, and celebrating uh, God rising on the third day. So today I just want to just emphasize on the fact of what happened on Good Friday, of Him dying on the cross, of His grace, of His mercy, of taking all our sin, all our iniquities, and having that reconciliation through Jesus, through Jesus' blood to the Father. Hallelujah. So let's pray. Amen. Lord, we just thank you, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for, for dying on that cross, Jesus, for taking all our sin, for taking our iniquities, for just giving us that amazing grace, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Through Jesus, through the blood that was spilt, we were made whole. Lord, we were made new, oh Father God, in you. Through that sacrifice on the cross. So we thank you, Father God, and we pray, Lord, for the spirit of reconciliation. We pray right now, Jesus, that by your blood, we are made whole, we are made new. That, Lord, that every single person here, oh Father God, will have a renewed spirit, oh Father God. Fresh fire, Lord. I pray for your fresh fire, Lord, to move in this place. We just thank you, O oh Father God, for your sacrifice, Jesus. We thank you, O oh Father God, that every pain that you took, O oh Father God, was for us. That, Lord, even 2,000 years ago, Lord, it's, it's a reality today, O oh Father God. So we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your blood, O oh Father God. We thank you, O oh Father God, that healing, O oh Father God, that is here through your blood, O oh Father God. We thank you, O oh Father God, that every blessing, O oh Father God, through that cross, O oh Father God, and through you rising again, fulfilling the law, Jesus, that we are here today made whole, made new in your image, Jesus, co-heirs with Jesus. So we thank you, O oh Father God, for that blessing, the blessing of the cross and, the, and just the gift of amazing grace that you have given us, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, in your precious name, Lord, we pray. And everybody says, Amen. 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 Amen.